Thanks, Marcy, for setting us up. Um, Yes, humans are, are complex and marvelous beings, and the, the rational model, I think, is one that has challenged the social change community for a long time. One of the best examples I give on why information alone doesn't solve social and cultural issues is the whole issue of uh, smoking cessation. There is tons and tons of information out there on why smoking cigarettes is bad for you, and yet people keep smoking, and it's not for lack of brochures. It's uh, not for lack of scientific data. It's not for lack of good information. We are complex beings, social pressures, cravings, all kinds of things play into why people do things that are not necessarily good for us or not necessarily rational. What I want to talk about today are some of the underlying strategies and approaches for um, today's uh, social change communications. We have a lot packed in this morning, so I want you to look at this as a quick tour. I want to give you a taste of some of the theory and some of the practice behind this. We'll have a lot of words packed in these slides, and uh, no fear. Uh, we will have all of this available for you after the conference, but I wanted you to have as much material. And because we'll be looking at language and words, we'll be packed with a little bit of this. So my goal this morning is give you an introduction, give you the flavor of uh, a couple of these approaches, and then we'll take some time this morning to practice with it. I'm going to spend my time today talking about two key strategies. One is this notion of framing, sometimes called frameworks analysis, sometimes just called the frame. Frames set the way we think about issues. They set the context for the issue, they set our cognitive process, and the social discourse around an issue. Uh, I'll also talk about values-based communications, which are in, uh, in many ways one element of a frame, and that's using widely held cultural values, uh, freedom is a good example here, to help give an issue context, personal meaning, and saliency, saliency. And by saliency, how important is it to me as an individual or me as a particular member of an audience? How close is it? Uh, to things that I care about, does it resonate with me? There are many other approaches. Some of you may know of uh, what's called narrative communications or story-based communications that uses classic Western uh, mythological typologies, there's a mouthful, um, to provide cultural meaning around an issue. Uh, social marketing is another tool that a lot of people use these days, uh, mostly for behavior change, but today we're gonna focus on framing and values-based communications. I want to give a little bit of credit where credit is due. A lot of what I learned about these things uh, comes from uh, some of the classic leaders in the field, and particularly I want to point out the Frameworks Institute. They have tremendous amounts of free resources on their website, including a really nice new module, which is sort of a self-coaching workshop that you can click on and, and uh, work through, and I would urge everybody who uh, gets excited about this work to take some time there. I also want to thank uh, the folks at Belden Rusinella Strategies. Uh, they are a public opinion research firm, and uh, um, have, I've worked with them over the last 15 years, and I just think they're top notch in the, in the field, and I've learned a lot about values from them. So as I said earlier, factual information alone doesn't really communicate with people. Uh, we live in a media-saturated culture, and you all know that, and there's constant appeals for our attention and our concern, whether it's on television these days, on the internet, and still the marvelous stream of junk mail that comes in through our mailboxes. Everybody wants our attention. They want us to care about their issue, their product, their candidate, and they're all using pretty complex and sophisticated approaches to try to reach us. And so when you're working on the kinds of issues that you are working on, it's very easy to get lost in the background noise of all these other calls and appeals for our attention. And so to communicate in a complex world where we're saturated, we need to create personal meaning for our audiences. For, for social change, we want people to understand what the issue is, why it's important to them, and what they can do about it. And if we're really successful, we'll also try to motivate them to take action. Messages need to be meaningful to connect. Um, concepts and values help assign that meaning. It helps people begin to, to understand why they might want to care. Understanding is frame-based, not fact-based. You have to understand an issue and be curious about it before you can assimilate the facts. And if you look at a lot of social change communications, we start out with the facts and long lists with them. We're really good at bullet point lists about the 26 reasons why we are right on an issue. But if people don't have the open door to receive that information, that fact sheet will get left on the table. 
our, the human mind uh, seeks cues to connect with established pictures and shortcuts. We have amazingly complex uh, brains, and they do amazing things. But in a world where we're saturated with information, the brain almost acts like a filing system. And if it doesn't get in the right filing cabinet at that first instant, your issue or your topic is going to go into a set of drawers that people will not be able to access later. Uh, a good example that I've heard uh, used many times is, for example, the issue of teenage pregnancy. If the issue in, in, uh, in your community is framed as bad parenting and lax morals among teenage girls, the solutions to that are very, very different if instead if it was framed as lack of opportunity, lack of access to uh, contraception and health care. The way you think about the initial problem begins to set up the way you will think about the actions and the solutions that go with it. And we often think that, again, we haul out the fact sheets and people have already set up how they're going to file the issue and how they're going to think about it. So that very early step in the cognitive process is where we need to meet our audiences. Reason, not rhetoric, helps break down barriers. We are very sophisticated arguers. We are very sophisticated messengers. And we can come up with really clever Alan Sorkin type lines to talk about our issues. Right? But if we slip into rhetoric, where we get into the heightened accusations, we're already seeing it, the exhaustion of being in yet another election year. Uh, you know, Who can have the more clever insult? Who can have the better zinger? Rhetoric tends to um, set up a set of defenses in us, and we begin to align with one side or another, and you lose the ability to have that rational conversation, to bring in the, re the reasoned approach. When we can take our arguments and our issues through a set of calm, reasonable steps that help people come to a conclusion, we will have a more open conversation and more likely uh, success in getting the message through. Uh, solutions and messages help us see where we as individuals fit in. Um, my background is in the environmental movement, and we were really, really good for at least 20 years in persuading people that the earth was going to hell in a handbasket. It was their fault. And, and what could we do about it? <clears throat> um, and so helping people understand what they can do in the solution. Is there a solution, or is it all about despair? Is there a way forward? Um, if we don't have a way forward, people will tend to go a couple different ways. Uh, psychologically, we can only handle so much doom. Right? So you will either turn off, or another psychological cue we use is, thank goodness this complex issue is being dealt with by experts somewhere else, because I can't handle it. Um, another thing people do is a process called adaptive uh, response or adaptive management. Um, this came up when we were working on some water quality issues, and we were trying to be, get people concerned about some provisions in the Clean Water Act. And the response from particularly beleaguered moms, busy working moms, was, well, if I just buy bottled water, then I don't have to think about all these other things. So when we don't provide a clear way that they can be involved in the solutions, we default to other things. And you don't want people to default away from your larger uh, challenges. Finally, we need the right messengers. Messenger research is showing us that the messenger is probably as important and sometimes more important than the message itself. And so the combination of a strong message and a strong messenger allows you to have authentic and credible and also I connecting through identity with your audiences. So those are the elements that give our messages meaning. So a little bit more on frames. A frame is the way information is conveyed. And these are all parts of a frame. Symbols, metaphors, we've talked about messengers, the visuals, what kind of images are you using, the message itself, the kind of story that can be told around the message, and then numbers and context. We tend to be heavy on numbers and facts and light on context and social issues. All these elements will create the frame, and that's what's going to tell us what's important, what can be ignored. I care about this. I don't care about that. That's extraneous. So the package of all of those begins to create the way we provide that sort of portal of meaning for people to come into an issue. Frames also, of course, influence decisions. And they are going to define how we talk about the issue. Uh, a really good frame and a really good message will help us understand who is responsible, both for the problem and the solution. And it will also spell out that there are potential solutions and what they are. 
Here's a couple of examples of active frames in the culture. You probably know a lot of them. Um, one of the ones that beleaguers us in the environmental field is the notion of burdensome regulation. I don't know about you, but I kind of think that somebody who is protecting my air quality is doing a good thing for society. But in our culture, this has been defined by and large in the dominant frame as a burden. Um, you may recognize some of these other ones. Whoops, sorry. So, burdensome regulation. We've heard that nanny state is a tension frame, one that people are trying to impose. I think uh, they've been pretty successful. Um, any, any 99 percenters out there today? Okay. Um, what are some other frames, anyone off the top of your head that you can think of that are active in our culture? Welfare queen, yep, yeah, that's a really potent one. Been with us for a while. Yeah. Job creators, job They're working on that one. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So sometimes you can pose the frame and the level of skepticism among perhaps the 99 percenters um, shows you where the tensions are. So the power that if you can set the overall tone of the debate and then you get them down to these sound bites, uh, really, really hard to get out of a frame once we're stuck in one. Um, the whole you know, jobs versus environment one has been a tremendous uh, anchor for the environment along, for a long, long time. So being aware that these are active in the culture and being aware when they're happening to you uh, allows you to both have your sort of frame alert up and helps impress, I think, upon you and all other messengers for the kind of work you're doing the need to be the positive framer as opposed to the reactive framer. So again, these are some of these core elements of the frame, the values, the language, the metaphors. Uh, a couple things I want to talk about um, on each of these. Again, values help ground that issue in cultural meaning and import. It's about freedom. It's about our children's future. It's about accountability. It's about justice. When you have that level of a frame, you begin to understand what's the issue really about at a very core, gut, intrinsic level. Language, of course, itself has power and is laden with all kind of meaning. And so we need to be really thoughtful about how we choose language, the words we use it. Even sometimes the sequence of words in a sentence can really change the meaning of a message. Metaphors, again, are the way we file things. So if you can describe what your issue is like, this is what my issue is like. Um, a good example, when some of the research that was being done on global warming, one of the research firms uh, suggested that uh, global warming was like a hot blanket thrown on you in the summer that you couldn't kick off ever. And it is a very different feel from that greenhouse, because you can leave a greenhouse, and they're pretty and they're nice, right? But that's hot, sticky summer blanket, um, what I thought was a much better metaphor. So thinking about what your issue is like, because the brain loves metaphors. If it can find anything that, a, that an issue is like, it's going to put it in that logical reasoning path. But you have to be careful, because if you get the wrong metaphor, it's very difficult to unfile it once it goes in that pathway. And again, our messengers create relationship. They create authenticity. They create identity. Most people vote for presidential candidates not because of the positions that they take, but because they identify with them in some way. Presidential politics are identity politics. And many of our issues can be identity uh, politics as well. So all of those things are, are part of how a frame gets set. The other thing I want to say about frames is there are generally three levels in a frame. At the highest level, it's this what's it all about at my, my gut, and that's that values level. Then it's what kind of an issue is this, and I think this is really important for the kind of issues you're working on. Is it a health issue? Is it an economic issue? Is it a medical research issue? Um, and with the environment, we've really tried to pull things out of the environment ghetto, because these in many ways are quality of life the way we live our lives, how we relate together as a society, to get unstuck into those labels that put you in. And then finally, down at the bottom of the list, there is the, you know, this might be Senate Bill 64 or Administrative Rule 37. And a lot of our communications get stuck down at that level. And so we need to start at the top of the frame and move down to the details as opposed to saying to people, you should care about this Senate bill. Well, if they don't care about the other parts, it's really hard to catch them down at that level. All right. 
just wanted to note that frames are indeed part of daily life. Uh, here's a little stone soup cartoon where Max's mother has purchased for him a bubble shooter, which he declares as lame. Dad comes in and saves the day by calling it the intergalactic alien vaporizer model, <coughs> which in Max's mind reframes it as a really cool, juicy weapon. And of course, the little boy gets excited about that because he's, Dad's done the reframing. But it's this kind of process that so rapidly can change an attitude or reaction in here in the fictional world, but also just be aware of the power of that in our daily work and our communications about issues. It's important for us, particularly on the kind of issues you're working on, to avoid the fear and catastrophe frames. As I said before, gloom and doom, people have the I'm out of here response. And crisis communications, by and large, does not sustain positive social change. It depresses people, and they don't want to have you over for dinner. Okay. <laughs> So focus on the positive solutions and give people a way through a crisis. There's nothing more empowering for somebody to understand that an issue that they thought was hopeless and complicated and going to ruin people's lives or have you know, huge negative consequences, that there might be a way to turn that ship around and they can be part of it. Uh, people want the world to be a better place and most people want to be part of doing that. So if you can find a way for people to see themselves in the solution, to bridge from the catastrophe, and to move forward, um, it will help in, a, in, in engaging people and also engaging them in the solutions that we seek. Marketers and fundraisers, unfortunately, are, uh, use a lot of catastrophe communications. It does raise money, but there is a sort of a burnout curve when, uh, and you see it after large natural disasters uh, and global crises where people just reach a certain point where they cannot respond anymore. So be really careful with the gloom, doom, and crisis. You know it's a crisis, um, and that's probably why you're involved. And you know it's scary, and that's probably why you're involved. But can you use your capacities to help people understand that there's a way forward? Another frame to be careful about is the defensive frame. Um, and we spend a lot of that. And when we get into defense, we're on somebody else's frame and on their turf and on their symbols and on their language. You can see people in, in public hearings or even in an interview or a debate room discussion, the shoulders get set. Sometimes the foot stomps. We get defensive. And you are off your best communications capacity. Sometimes you need to defend. But try not to get pulled into the rhetoric, the arguments, the defense of the opposition. Um, I saw Lisa Jackson on Stephen Colbert the other night, uh, head of the EPA, and they were having a fun conversation. Then he turned to her and he said, so why do you hate jobs? Right? And that was a moment. I thought, oh, I hope she was coached for this. And she sort of got it. She sort of got it. So thank you, Lisa. Um, but she said, oh, we don't hate jobs. But that's immediately reinforcing the language of the other position. Then she talked about all the good things that um, you know, they're doing through environmental protection and even creating some jobs. But be very, very careful, because people want you, you know, your opposing views want you in those boxes. And we spend a lot of time defending on other people's frame. So just have your frame alert up. Uh, it's easier if you can find ways to bridge. And, and here's an example of bi some biopolitical frames that I think are out there. One, this notion that uh, bi biotechnical research is economic development, scientific progress, makes money, improves lives. Why shouldn't people profit from this? Okay. Oops. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, another is this notion of regulating biotech and gen genetic engineering will slow down advances that will uh, deny someone treatment and could save lives. Well, these both sound like plausible and reasonable things. Um, if indeed those are uncomfortable frames for you, and I suspect they might be, um, use a way to bridge forward. So. You can do a short acknowledgement, well, why? While, while biotechnological research is providing many insights, we need to make sure that the research is conducted safely and responsibly, and that potential benefits don't also result in inadvertent harm to our children, our environment. Long-term public safety, health, and security should guide our decisions and safeguard, safe, about safeguards in the field. So you've done a little pause, didn't dwell on it, moved to I think the things that you care about. So there's an example, and you could probably all write a better bridge, but that's a way to go from somebody else's frame to your own. Uh, both George Lakoff and the folks at Frameworks Institute have good coaching on how to bridge from one frame to another without getting stuck in the defensive position. 
Tone is also critical, and this reemphasizes this notion of finding solutions. We have the ability to uh, communicate our fear. And uh, particularly, as I said, in the environmental field, we're really, really good at the chicken little approach. Uh, finding the way forward. What is the way forward? Is there a little engine that could? Is there a positive way we can get through this big problem? And often that involves working together. So really being cognizant of the tone of our communications. Is there a sense of hope, efficacy, a way forward? One of the challenges we face, and one of the things that feeds into negative framing, is that we communicate a lot of our work through the news media. And the news world has its own set of filters and its own, in a sense, frame that it imposes on our communications. So the medium really influences the way your information is communicated. And as you know, news thrives on controversy, on celebrity, on the things that get our attention. There's that saying for the local news, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. These are the ways this information is communicated to us. Uh, news also likes this notion of two sides to the issue. This has been particularly complicated on an issue like uh, climate change, where something like 97% of the world's climate scientists are uh, thoroughly persuaded that we are in a changing climate, but three uh, other, you know, percent might not be, and they try to provide this as one equal side against the other. So when you get that equal weighting of unequal representation, um, it, it works for, for a reporter. It doesn't necessarily work for the way society is grappling with these issues. So pay attention to how the news box itself imposes uh, its constraints on your stories and on the way you need to tell your stories. News is also often about individuals. We like stories about real people. That's part of what's attractive about news. It is less about society, about community, how we make decisions together. And those other things are in many ways the way democracy works and the way we need to convey our issues. These are social decisions for the most part, not individual decisions. But news does not lend itself well to that conversation. Alternatively, then, you can communicate your themes and provide your own context. Try to connect those dots across issues. Use features, opinion pieces, lifestyle media is a really good way to get a story told, and topical media, uh, whether it's Golf Digest or Biotechnology Today. Uh, there are people who are coming to those uh, particular things through a particular lens of interest. They're going to be reading a longer story. They're going to be able to assimilate information because it's come to a pre-selected area that they're already interested. And again, this notion of talking about societal solutions, not just the individual solution. Here's a, a couple clippings from my local newspaper. Uh, you may know we're having a terrible drought in the Midwest this year. And within two weeks of each other, one headline on the corn farmers bracing for small yields and big losses, and then um, uh, just a few days later, this incredible flooding storm that hit Duluth and Superior. Um, is there a connection between these stories? I mean, for me, these are about, these are about, this is climate change happening, folks. And neither story actually mentioned the word climate, <laughs> this carbon dioxide. And that's, again, the news. These were episodes. These were moments. There were crises. People were in, in danger. That's the way news tells the story. Here's an example from uh, the biopolitical field. These all ran, uh, four stories appeared within three weeks in the New York Times, and again, um, no dots connected, no threads across them that shows that these are really part of a larger set of issues around the way genetics and biotechnology are playing themselves out in our lives. So episodic communications, and that's what frameworks call this, is a really big challenge as you're trying to communicate about this work. And the idea is to bridge to thematic communications, finding ways that a constant theme cuts across your stories. That requires vigilance. It requires coalitions. It requires sharing your stories with each other and looking for those identifying themes so that they can resonate across topics. So let's go a little bit deeper now into values-based communications. Um, these are a core element of themes. They're a core element of frames, and I want to spend most of our time on those. Um, values are durable in our society. They stick around for decades. And often by the time we're adults, our core values are pretty well cooked. 
You can influence them a little bit. Somebody has sometimes a life crisis and changes their values, but it's pretty rare. But, so by the time we're adults, our, our cultural values are pretty well established. Values-based communication um, uses these values to define the problem and also explain who's responsible. It addresses the concern, provides a solution, suggests responsive acts, actions, and you see this is a theme within the frame, and uses the messengers and stories and images and language to reinforce that message. We communicate to activate values, not to get people to have them. Right? So this is not about changing someone's approach to values or having them learn your values. It's about activating the values they already have. Values-based communication works because the values shift the debate to things we care about deeply, not those isolated facts. But different values fit different people in different situations, and very few one-size-fits-all here, as the dogs acknowledge those cats have really different sets of core values. Um, so again, we're trying to activate them, not change them, and we're avoiding values judgments. We're leading people to their own values. So the approach is to identify your audience's values and their concerns. Again, these are ideals, core beliefs, such as responsibility, freedom, respect for God's creation, fairness, love of country, and we'll get into a few more details here. Uh, values by themselves are not inherently conservative. They've been used by uh, conservative uh, positions and conservative messengers, but we all have values, and I suspect that's one of the reasons you're here, is you're acting on your values, and we can use them too. Concerns are things that we're worried about. Um, they might be health, jobs, money. Uh, these are not at the same level as values, not cognitively, not emotionally inside of us. So a lot of messages speak to concerns, but if you can link up a little higher and get to values, you'll get deeper meaning. And most messages need to speak to both. Globally, this is from the research of the Institute uh, for Global Ethics. Um, they looked at a bunch of studies and uh, reduced down the basic human values across societies. And they actually, these actually make me feel pretty good about the human species. Um, so across the world, we care about fairness, truth, compassion, and responsibility, and respect. Um, and when we use this kind of language, uh, and when we use language that evokes these kinds of values, we begin to communicate with people again at that deeper level. Values are different across cultures, though, and I just want to point out a, a couple differences uh, from cross-cultural cross studies. Um, one study looked at the kinds of values that we have, uh, and in the United States, they said people tend to hold values in the self-enhancement dimension, things such as success, capability, independence, and choosing their own goals. Uh, and American values tended to lean less towards transcendence and uh, altruism. Another study looked at what they called egoistic concerns, um, which are self, health, quality of life. Um, prosperity and convenience, social altruistic concerns, focusing on other people, children, family, community, and humanity, and one that they were calling biospheric concerns, focusing on the well-being of living things. Um, and in the United States, we tend towards the egoistic values, and that's just important for us to know as we try to communicate with our fellow Americans. It's also important to know as we try to communicate across cultures and across the world. Here's a summary list of uh, American core values. This comes out of work from Belden, Rusin, and Ellen Stewart, and also uh, earlier research projects by the Pew uh, Research Center. Uh, different, different researchers will come up with slightly different lists, but this is a pretty classic list of core American values. They're split between primary and secondary. You can see the primary values on, on the left here. Responsibility, big American value, both uh, to caring for in the family and for oneself. This notion of take care of yourself. Um, uh, uh, personal liberty, one of the most uh, durable American values. The whole notion of the work ethic. Uh, spirituality, most Americans believe in some higher spiritual power. Honesty and integrity, fairness and equality. You notice the secondary values go a little bit more towards the altruism. Caring for others, although personal fulfillment is on that list. Respect for authority. I sometimes joke this skipped my generation, but um, uh, the Boy Scouts know this. Um, uh, love of country or culture. We love to wave our flags in this country. We're proud to be Americans. Um, and this notion of freedom of choice. 
And some of these things here under intangibles that have come for other research, from other research, not necessarily values, but closely linked to them, quality of life, our sense of place, and our sense of security and safety, which, which was heightened after 9-11. You've been doing a lot of work on this notion of bio, biopolitical values, um, social justice, democratic governance, common good, ecological integrity, precaution, human rights. These are all great values, but I was looking at them the other day and I thought these are all at the social altruistic level. And none of these are at the primary value level. And values have rank. And that's just something, as you look at your communications, if you can bridge from these values to the higher values, such as um, freedom, personal liberty, responsibility. And I think for you, responsibility is going to be one of those winner values. So I'm going to try to just quickly go through here some of the values-based messages approaches. Again, they state why your audience should care, describe the threat, provide the solution, and an action. So let's go through some examples. So here's a sample message we did on Wisconsin's lakes and waters, and I'm just going to read it to you. You don't have to take notes. <laughs> Whoops, sorry. Wisconsin's beautiful lakes, rivers, and natural areas are the places where our families go to swim, boat, and hike, and just plain enjoy. Our wetlands help maintain the balance of nature by filtering and cleaning our water and air. These precious resources belong to all of us, but they're threatened by too much careless development, pollution and abuse, and the destruction of shoreline and wetland habitat. We all share the responsibility to defend Wisconsin's valuable water resources so we can continue to enjoy them and depend on them for generations to come. We can have development and still protect our irreplaceable resources, but we must enforce our pollution laws and plan development wisely. And each of us can take action in our own lives and communities to conserve and defend Wisconsin's waters every day. And that's just a generic message. Uh, and again, when we start people out writing these, we try to use some of the real value words in there and get people comfortable with the notion. If you were working with that message, you would add at the end, insert your personal action here or insert your right to your legislator here. So that's the way to set up a message. They're not a sound bite, they're a paragraph, that, a short paragraph that has your core rationale. So we start with values. Here's another one we did on uh, Great Lakes water diversions. Great Lakes are one of the natural wonders of the world and it's our responsibility to protect them. There's that responsibility word again. They're a resource to use and protect. They're at the heart of the ecosystems we rely on for life. They're a gift of nature that's evoking the God value without saying the G word, whose beauty and bounty enrich our lives and identify our region. Then we move into a threat. Yet there are those who would sell the Great Lakes water for private profit. And we learned from focus groups that people just thought the notion of profiting from selling the Great Lakes was heinous. So we used it. Um, <clears throat> like oil or lumber, so we gave them a metaphor. Selling water like oil or lumber made people flinch. Okay. The region is using our water faster than nature can replenish it. There's no regional policy that will prevent exports or overuse within the system. And again, this is a little overlabored and detailed, but that's where we were. And then what can we be done? Why should we act? We again invoke responsibility to protect and conserve the lakes, not for a single interest, for our families. And then we add the environment in, secondary. And we can all take steps now to help keep the lakes healthy forever. And then we had a list of what those steps were. So that's the construction of an arc of a values-based message. Here's another one I like. This was on climate change from the uh, US and the World Group. Uh, and here they pretty much skipped by the whole problem statement, went straight to the solution. And the solution was that we have a national commitment to invest in newer, cleaner sources of energy and make more efficient use of what we have. It would create new jobs and competitive industries, help clean up our environment and improve our security. So we got investment in the future here, security, um, efficiency. We address the concerns of cleaner energy and a healthy environment. The tone is pragmatic. We can do this. We can get there. And the action is to invest in clean energy and efficiency. That's a really elegant uh, message. So building a message. Um, here's one on biotechnology we can play with. Um, the unbridled biotechnology rush can create more harm than good. There's a little rhetoric in there. 
While biotechnology offers many profound potential solutions to address human needs, it also brings risks to human research subjects, to the environment, and to future generations. It can also draw resources away from broader health and social needs. The pace of biotechnology development needs to be balanced with scientific integrity, human safeguards, and careful assessment of the potential risks and benefits, including who gains and who profits from advances in the field, and who was harmed or placed at risk. And the colored highlights there are to grab the values of the concerns. And then a potential solution statement. Responsible and precautionary approaches to biotechnology development are necessary to ensure the safety, health, and welfare of people living today and future generations. So we brought in today and future generations. These approaches must also consider the fair and equitable use of social resources to solve social challenges. Government agencies, research institutions, and private corporations must agree to ethical and equitable principles and practices that will safeguard humans and society and environmental integrity while providing humane and compassionate solutions to challenging health and social issues. Add your actions here. So we, this is one where I just threw them all in there. We got compassion, we got responsibility. But you can see how you can evoke these and begin to put them in a message. Here are just a couple other examples. Here's a, an ad that we did on a sprawl campaign I was working on. So here you can see that we've evoked future generations. We uh, are talking about community, we're talking about health, we're talking about quality of life. Um, and that's a very different way of talking about sprawl uh, instead of talking about zoning. Then just a couple of active messages that, I, that caught my attention. I went on, on the line, on one, one line and Googled um, uh, GMO foods the other day, and here's a couple that I found. Um, here's one about why GMO foods are bad for you. Uh, and it starts out uh, with the history of what they are, and then gets into the details of soybean yields. Um, and then we see down here, they're bad for you. It's not quite sure why, but we know that they're bad for us. Um, and then there were, I have the eight, it's a bullet points that are about this long online about all the things that are wrong about GMO foods. Very useful, and if you're interested and concerned, it was a good list. But the, the very last thing was now you, you can do something, but your best defense is to purchase certified organic food, which cannot contain them, and tell your friends not to, to do the same. And it's, the solution is down to the individual level. Um, we don't have a, a values context for this, and it's assuming we care, it's assuming we want to take action, and it's assuming that facts will compel us to do it. It's well written and well researched, but it doesn't grab you unless you're already inside the family. Here's another one. Um, this is on the about.com site, and are genetically engineered uh, foods bad for your health? Um, and the answer is, as far as we know, uh, they're healthy and safe. And they're closely regulated. Um, <clears throat> uh huh, uh huh. Goes on, and, and you've probably been consuming them for quite some time. Okay. Um, so some of the arguments in this one, and I really like these in terms of rhetorical um, use. So people have been doing to this foods naturally for many years, and it's old-fashioned. You know, the old-fashioned way was crossbreeding. Um, and it was slow, sort of limited. Well, nobody wants to be slow and limited. Um, and genetically engineered plants are researched for safety. And here's a long list of who's doing the research for safety for you. Are you feeling safer? OK. Um, and uh, let's see. So they're regulating health, the environment, and food safety. And I love this last paragraph. Um, the words genetically modified or genetically engineered may sound scary. But there's really great potential for saving lives and improving health by making these changes to the plants with the, that provide foods we eat every day. So we're already eating this stuff, probably safe, right? And it's, it just sounds scary. Now, I don't know who this writer is. I don't know how they came to these conclusions. I will say they're really good right, at what they do. Um, but this is how what looks like a simple fact sheet is framing the issue. And part of what's elegant about this frame is that if you want to oppose it, if you want to say, well, those agencies really aren't protecting our health, they really aren't doing the work, then you're playing into a larger frame, which is that your government is inept, and government agencies aren't worth what we pay for them in the first place. So it's just a brilliant set of frames within frames. Um, and this is just one website on GMO foods. And that's the role that framing is playing and just one slice of the many issues that you're working on. So, 
As we close here, um, reminder, framing sets the context, the cognition, and the discourse. And that cognition is probably the most important thing. Values-based communication uses these widely held cultural values to provide personal meaning and begin thinking about which values provide personal meaning for you. And I hope that after we're done here, you'll be paying attention to how these approaches shape your communications, how your audiences see your issues, and how you write your messages and develop your communications. All of you are messengers, and we will hope to make you stronger messengers, and I invite you to become a deconstructor of frames. Once you've played with this, you can't watch a television commercial or do many other things without going, oh, there they go again. I see what they're trying to do. Uh, and we want to empower you to be skilled framers. Framing is not about dumbing down an issue. It's about being smart about the cognitive processes and the ways your audience will see your issue.